Hey people, welcome to Accidental Gods, to the podcast where we believe that another world is still possible and that together we can make it happen. I'm Manda Scott, your host at this place on the web where art meets activism, politics meets philosophy, and science meets spirituality, all in the service of conscious evolution. And my guest this week is someone that I have been wanting to speak to for a long time. Louis Weinstock is a child psychologist. He's a game designer. He's a human being who is working at the leading edge of what it is to be human in this moment of transition. We came to him because so many of the people in Accidental Gods, either the people that we interview for the podcast or the members of our membership program, are adults who struggle to know how to speak to their children about the times that we're in. We can no longer feed them the stories of their world being better and brighter and bigger and more full of good stuff that they can have than our world was. That reality has broken down. And we don't know what to replace it with. And Louis has a website called Finding Our Light in the Darkness. And I want to read you a little bit of his bio before we head in. He says, I work with children and the child inside us all. The one that wants to be loved. The one that wants to cry. The one that knows what it wants. The one that really does dance like nobody's watching the one that spends timeless hours looking at bugs under a piece of bark, the one that keeps getting up, no matter how many times they have fallen down. I help people find a light in the darkness, especially in grief, in the shadow, in the things that are unseen, unheard and unspoken. I see death as our greatest teacher and avoidance of it our biggest mistake. And I read that, and I felt that if we could bring some of this to the Accidental Gods podcast, to the Accidental Gods world, it would be a good day in our world. And, as ever, this podcast went to places I wasn't expecting. Usually, they're conversational places. In this particular instance, as you'll hear, we went to places inside me that I wasn't expecting. And it was a profoundly moving experience. So we share it that you may explore similar places within you. Because I really do believe that this is the way we move to where we need to be. So people of the podcast, please do welcome Louis Weinstock. So Louis Weinstock, welcome to the Accidental Gods podcast and thank you so much for taking time out after your Greek visit. Was it good in Greece? It sounded amazing. It was amazing, yeah. We've been going there for about 15 years now to Catalonia. It's such a peaceful, lush place. Just, you know, you wake up in the morning and you've got the sound of goats with bells around them walking down down the hill and wow. just it just an instant relaxation feeling going there. Love it. Yes. And a way to recharge batteries after what I imagine must be a life that requires quite a lot of recharging. Yes. So, although goats with bells. Many years ago when I was a vet, I worked with some people who had cows with bells and they said, you know, they spend a lot of time kneeling in the mud and they jam their bells in the mud. And I think that's because it's driving them completely crazy. Probably. Walking around with this thing jangling every time you move. But the cows had learned how to silence them. I was deeply impressed and spent quite a lot of time trying to persuade them to take the bells off the cows, <laughs> which worked in the end. Anyway, so you do a number of things, but you're essentially, you specialize in working with vulnerable children and young people on the margins of society, helping them to process their grief and their alienation and everything that our society does in taking these amazing little forager hunters that we give birth to, those who give birth, and then turning them into what we turn them into. So always at the start of this podcast and here as well as ever, I would really like it if you could situate us in your life and how you came to be someone who has the skill and capacity 
and desire to take on something that sounds so huge to me and so profound? Wow. Well, firstly, thank you for sort of describing the um, situation so well and so lucidly um, in terms of the hunter-gatherer children and what we turn them into. I guess that was, in a way, my experience, like it is most of our experiences. I uh, grew up in a in a loving uh, family with its own flaws, like all families have flaws. And when I became a teenager, I um, started to feel increasingly disaffected, like many teenagers do. Although, interestingly, and perhaps we can talk about this later, um, the idea of a stormy adolescence is a very Western idea. It's not actually as universal as we think it is. But it certainly was in my case, and um, I started getting into trouble at school with the police and um, getting involved in various things that, you know, looking back, probably shouldn't have done. And I ended up, when I was about 17, I, I came back from sort of raving all weekend and I had a, a moment with my uh, parents who were waiting for me. My mum got really upset and started crying. My dad got really angry. And I often refer back to that as a bit of a turning point in my life, both for better and for worse, because I woke up the next day and I was like, mm, I don't really want to be this angry, disgruntled teenager who's creating suffering for other people anymore. And I did this very sort of naive drawing on a post-it note. I remember it very clearly. I just drew two smiley faces. One smiley face had one smiley face equals smiley faces. So um, that was me being inspired by rave culture and also compassion. Um, So I kind of, that was in a way my turning point. And I started sort of just wanting to be a, a better person. I also... Uh, and I'll talk about this perhaps later, but I also disconnected from my anger a lot at that point. And I've been reclaiming that more recently. Hmm. But I started wanting to help people. Um, I started with a job at university where I was a support worker for a disabled couple who are amazing. I'm still friends with them now, uh, Mike and Linda. And then Partly by chance and also by following this path, I um, I did some work with young homeless people. I think a lot of it is the typical sort of wounded healer journey where you uh, end up working in places where you're actually really trying to heal your own wounds fundamentally, and that was definitely true for me. Um, and there was something about working with young people on the edges of society that it was helping me. Um, so... Remember, for example, I used to run a therapeutic school for uh, teenagers who had complex trauma and were kicked out of lots of other schools. And I always used to think that the kids who came to that school were much more real, Mm. way more alive than the majority of people, typically middle, middle class people that I would hang around with. And I think that's quite telling, perhaps, because... I think my experience has been that we do cover up a lot of our aliveness, you know, a lot lot of our, what you call the hunter-gatherer sort of uh, instincts, um, many of which, as you know, I'm sure a lot of listeners know, are actually much better than we have assumed them to be. Hmm. So that's been my journey, really. I've supported vulnerable children and young people now for over 20 years, more recently trained as a a child psychotherapist and I've been doing that for the last years as well as running this charity called A Part of Me where we help young people uh, on a journey from grief to compassion. Gosh there is so much there. Let's start at the end of that then. Tell me more about your charity because the little that I know of it sounds really enthralling on every level. Did you set this up? Yeah so I set it up with uh, Ben Page who's co-founder and he's um, uh, the backstory is I met his wife at a meditation retreat. Uh, At the time I was um, working on and off with Headspace the mindfulness app and company. I'd actually invited them into the school I was running to uh, develop a sort of mindfulness for kids with complex trauma program. And then they invited me back to do some work for them about kids and mindfulness. And so I was already starting to think about what the what the greater possibilities for design and digital technology to solve what I was becoming increasingly aware of as a growing crisis in child mental health. And uh, I met Kirsty, a child psychologist on a meditation retreat, and she said, oh, my husband's an amazing techie guy, and he really wants to use his skills for good. Huh. So we started chatting, and and then I was working at hospice in 
Hackney, uh, part of a psychology service where I was providing counselling support to families, either where a um, parent usually or a sibling had a terminal illness or somebody had died and it was more uh, sort of, I guess, traditional grief support. And during that time, we started to realise that there was um, a real need for a more innovative solution to help young people with grief Mm. because the sorts of young people who end up in a counselling service, they're usually more resourced and um, even then... I was meeting lots of young people with real um, challenges in their grief. They've gone down lots of really challenging paths. Uh, So we set up this charity, A Part of Me, and it's based around a therapeutic mobile game. And um, the idea is, and it's been working well so far, is to provide a accessible platform for young people, particularly those who are at risk of developing problems in their grief, so that they don't end up down that path of mental health problems, offending behaviour and all of the things that we know from the research are associated with what's called complicated grief. So are you able to tell me about the game? I, I ask as a as an addicted gamer, I've given up World of Warcraft four times so far, but on Monday I'm leading my first battleground again. So we'll see how well that went. So I've probably just lost most of our listenership, but but I'm really curious to know how this game works because most games we all know this, feed into our dopamine systems by feeding us little successes at random. Um, and in the case of of the ones that allow you to fight other people, you have the, the competitive edge. As someone who used to do battle reenactment, I find that Warcraft gives me exactly the same buzz as winning on a battlefield did when it was all mud and rain and sleeping under the stars and listening to them singing the philosopher's song at four in the morning when they were all drunk. And I don't have to do any of that bit. I get to stay dry and have showers and not listen to drunk men singing and I can still have the buzz. But that's not probably healing complex trauma, really. So how are you creating a game that is engaging and healing? Um, so we essentially have designed a, um, a safe space is the simplest way to describe it. So it's based on an island and uh, your character arrives on the island and we're quite direct about the purpose of the game. So as soon as you land on this island, you come through this stormy uh, sky and you're greeted by a guide, the guide of the island, who is this wise elder who explains that they've been through something similar to you. Their role is to support you through your process. So uh, the game is essentially based around um, exploring this island, meeting different characters, uh, listening to stories that you can find in a cave from other Mm. young people who have lost loved ones. Uh, And then there's some more direct therapeutic tools that have been turned into more sort of game-like elements so you collect rock rocks and you drop them in the rock pool and they um, uh, unlock meditations that are focused on helping through grief you catch fireflies in a net and each firefly uh, teaches you uh, wisdom about a particular emotion that people experience around grief there's another feature where you learn about uh, different perspectives on death and dying Uh, That was really important for us because there's so many different perspectives and we didn't want to just be beholden to one single narrative of death and how to process death and what happens when you die. Uh, And then there's one other feature worth mentioning, which is um, quests. Hmm. This was really important for us because uh, quests are essentially a challenge where you are able to ask questions and have conversations that would usually be really difficult or uncomfortable conversations. So, for example, if you choose the pathway in the game where you have a loved one who has a terminal illness, a quest might be to get you to ask that person, say it's your mum or your dad, ask them what their favourite memory of you was when you were growing up or Mm -hmm. how do you remind them of them, those kind of questions that allow you to build that bridge, which is often really difficult because when somebody is facing the end, so many conversations can become fraught 
uh, especially with children, because a lot of parents, you know, you know, in some ways, I, I really understand this. They really want to protect their children from the brutal reality. But when you do that, it often makes everything seem superficial. In my experience, children are much more intelligent and sensitive and kind of pick up on what's going on. Mm. So that feature is really encouraging those connections and those difficult conversations. So if I were, let's say, a seven-year-old, I'm playing this game and I'm assuming that my parents have encouraged me to play this game and I've got the quest and let's say my dad is dying, the quest is for me to actually sit down and go and put the phone down away from the game and go and talk to my dad and ask him the questions that the quest has given me? Well, there's kind of options within that. So we felt the simplest way in the first instance would be to send. So there's a share feature. You can just send that question. Mm. And the answers right. can get stored in a, in a digital journal. Right. But obviously, it's great if that conversation can be um, supported in real life. I right. mean, as much as a digital uh, platform can help with any type of mental health problem, I also am a huge believer in the importance of uh, in-person, face-to-face interactions. Um, so this was a stepping stone. Yeah. And it's really what we have out there at the moment. It's been used by, uh, it's been played by over 90,000 people around the world, which is great and yes. a really good start. But it really is sort of the first step. It's a um, prototype and we're actually um, just starting a fundraising journey at the moment to bring on board a core team of brilliant game designers and developers and, and various people to help us really expand the um, impact and the reach of the game. Brilliant. Oh, this is so amazing. I used to work for a computer games company long, long ago between being a vet and being a writer. I think I would like to put you in touch with that team because I think they would be really interesting. The guy who runs the company is David Braben, who wrote a game called Elite, which was the best-selling game on every platform back in the mid to late 80s, I would think. Um, And now he runs Frontier Developments Limited in Cambridge, which is, yeah, it would be really exciting to bring you and him together. And besides which, I want want to be on the writing team for this. Um, Let's take a step back. This sounds so exciting, and we could spend the entire podcast talking about gaming, but bearing in mind that our listenership might not like that. You spoke about different perspectives around death and dying. And can we unpick that a little bit? Can you talk us through what some of the perspectives that you are aware of around death and dying are? Because it seems to me we are facing the death of our civilization, possibly our own deaths, in the very near future. It's basically happening around us. And we don't have Whatever age we are, we don't have the tools to process this. So could we talk about that a little bit? I would um, slightly separate perspectives and tools, only because perspectives is one very important tool, but then there's other tools that aren't perspectives, if that makes sense. So the actual feature in the game is really sharing a, a mixture of spiritual and religious perspectives on death and dying, And also um, uh, there's one, uh, you could say, atheist or non-spiritual perspective, although that is still very nature-based, I would say, and it's kind of, you know, the perspective that we can observe that our bodies uh, decompose or get decomposed, and then they support other life to grow. Um, And actually Mm -hmm. that's a really, really simple and honest and helpful perspective for children yes. there's a there's a, actually a really great uh, book that i recommend for um younger children who are struggling with death called um lifetimes i think it's called lifetimes which has just beautiful illustrations and talks about that sort of life and death process in a very natural way so that would be the perspectives i would say and then I think you were also orienting more towards sort of tools, like how do we actually deal with the reality of losing someone or something that's so precious to us? Hmm. I mean, obviously, my focus is mainly with children and young people, although I've done a lot of grief work with adults as well. My 
feeling and my experience is that more than anything else, uh, it's not a technical problem, really. It's more we need just spaces where it's okay to be honest about Mm. what we're thinking and feeling. And just to give you a specific example of that, um, I ran a uh, one of the first grief workshops I ever did for young people at a festival called Wider Horizons, which is an amazing festival. I, I'm going to give it a plug. I don't know if it will make it into the podcast, but uh, run by a friend of mine. It's really about young people who are on that transition to adulthood and empowering them. There's so many, so many amazing teachers and amazing work going on there. I thought... I'm doing this workshop called The Magic Power of Grief. And I thought on a Sunday morning at this festival of young people, young adults, there was all this other cool stuff going on. I thought I'll be lucky if I get five people there. In the end, the tent was completely packed out. Mm. There was about 60 people in there. Wow. So what I really uh, was amazed by in this workshop is uh, the courage of the young people who came, the honesty and uh and particularly how powerful it is uh even for young people i don't know why i'm saying even for young people but to have a really tight knit group sitting in an enclosed space in a safe space and even those who aren't sharing things they just naturally tune into this sort of energetic sense that this is a place where it is safe for me to connect to my feelings even the ones that are more uncomfortable and I've seen that happen now time and again in the workshops that I've run it just is creating that um, safe space not really there's not much technical stuff although I really love to use uh, do you know um, Francis Weller yes he wrote the wild wild the wild edge of sorrow and he has the five gateways of grief right so I use that in a um, we go deep into a meditation using those gateways to unlock the different sort of parts of ourselves that might be feeling the grief for loved ones, the grief for our ancestors, grief for the world. It's an amazing structure. Do you happen to know, so we've got loved ones, ancestors, the world, that's three out of five. Do you remember the other two off the top of your head? So the other two are grief for what we expected but did not receive. And the other one, I'm pretty sure, is grief for the parts of ourselves that haven't received love. Okay. All right. That sounds sounds glorious. I think we're going to get a lot of people signing up on your workshops as a result of this. And it always seems to me, I have to say, when I've worked with young people, they are desperate to find a space that feels authentic, that they're surrounded by a world that is marked and defined by its inauthenticity and that when they find authenticity and they find a space that allows them to speak their truth it feels like a coming home and we spoke earlier you said that the forager hunter model of of what we are and then we domesticate ourselves into this unreality and that teenage angst was a western thing which speaking given that i spent a lot of the Boudicca books, as I was writing them, deeply embedded in as much anthropology as I could find to try and work out who we were before the Romans came. I blame the Romans for a lot of this. How have you seen teenage angst and how it could be and what adolescence could be if we allowed it to be healthy? Does that make sense as a question? It does, yes. So, I think it's important to say that there is something biological about adolescence. There's been studies, as they always do these studies on mice and rats, where they show that adolescent pups are more likely to take risks, and risk-taking is a significant feature of uh, moving into adulthood. And it's also an evolutionary advantage, because without that risk-taking cultures don't evolve Hmm. Um, so there is something biological about it but in our sort of the modern western culture we've extended that period of adolescence now i mean some people sort of uh, joke that it goes well on into the 30s at least these days one of the things perhaps obviously that we've lost uh, are the rites of passage that 
in more traditional or tribal cultures really have evolved over time as mechanisms to support that transition mm. from tr childhood to maturity to adulthood. And the key thing about those rites of passage is a young person will be given a challenge mm. um, and they'll be taken away from their comfort zone. But the challenge is a real challenge. For example, um, I understand in some Native American cultures, uh, the young person would be taken to the top of a, a mountain and essentially left to fend for themselves for three days and nights. But there are uh, elders who are keeping an eye out for them, so they're not completely on their own. And when they've gone through this challenge, obviously there's a significant psychological shift that's happened then. And the big thing, the big differentiating factor is when they come back into the community, they then have a different role. So we have some sort of rites of passage in our culture that sort of, you know, very loosely continue that theme. Some people feel that going to university can be a rite of passage, and it is in many ways, but it, I feel like what's happened is we've sort of dragged out adolescence and extended the period of essentially this sort of intermediate phase where you're neither a, a child nor a mature adult and there are real problems mm. with that um, especially in a time when young people are increasingly exposed to some really difficult realities in the world which kind of force them in one sense to to grow up in a sense they have to find a way to cope with the realities of climate change you know just even single events that are representative of broader social problems like the murder of George Floyd. Mm. When that video um, spread around the world, I had a number of clients who were really struggling to process the grief and the emotions that they felt around that. So, you know, it's we can't really protect our young people from these realities anymore, but we need to find ways to support them to make that transition into adulthood. And... If we were to design a route from our current culture to one that was more healthy and more supportive, have you ideas of what we could do now? We don't have time to create blanket systemic change, but if you were asked to advise, I don't know, people who had the power to make it happen, of some things that we could do to begin to create that sense of authenticity, can you see a route? It may be that there isn't one, that we would have to change the whole of our culture so much that it's hard. But have you got ideas? Well, firstly, I really want to say that when you mentioned earlier in the conversation about authenticity and how much young people are just craving that in a, in a world that's marked by inauthenticity, I really felt that and felt moved by that, not just as a person who supports children and young people but as a person in the world who experiences that himself and you know it's easy to sort of say well what young people really need but I always think it's just reflective of what we all need isn't it we're all yearning for more authenticity mm -hmm. and I do think with my focus on children that the starting point for that is the people who are caring for them so that's parents, obviously, in the first instance, and that's teachers, anyone else who's caring for children. They can really begin to be that model of authenticity. Mm. And what that requires, essentially, is to trust, I think, in the children's capacity to, to bear things. I mean, we've, we've, we've essentially ended up in, in our culture in a place where Children are treated as precious treasures, and they are precious in many ways, uh, but we end up overprotecting them, and we've forgotten their sort of innate capacity to bear things, to be able to tolerate difficult things. And actually, mm. I really love, uh, you know, the concept anti-fragile from uh, Taleb, Nassim, Nassim Taleb. Uh, that concept applies perfectly to human beings, to children, because they 
Um, they aren't China teacups. They need to be exposed to some stresses and some risks, reasonable stresses and risks to allow their fullest potential to grow. And just to make it very concrete for a moment, one of the things, because I work a lot in, in death and grief, I see so many um, parents really worried about mentioning anything to do with death with their children. And I think my, my advice is really don't need to worry so much. Obviously, don't just overload them with really challenging stories or expose them to too much stuff. But just to give you a very specific example, I've been quite proactive with my daughter in pointing out when we walk past things that have died and having a space where we can talk about the thoughts and feelings that come up. And it can start very early on in life. And 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 I'm as much as I can, I try and be honest about my own feelings as well. And that's really where the authenticity thing comes in. Because mm. I think sometimes we can feel as parents or grown-ups that the grown-ups are supposed to have figured it all out, that we've got the answers and that we need to be in control. Yeah. And if we're not in control, uh, then our children will feel that the world is chaotic and you know they'll just crumble or something like that. Uh, but actually, that old idea of power is just dissolving anyway, right before our eyes. You know, we see the institutions that represent power and the bastions of truth. It's all crumbling before our eyes. And it's much better and more mm. realistic and more likely to build strong and empowered children if we can be honest about that in ourselves. We don't lose anything. I think we actually gain trust uh, through holding that sort of just authentic stance. Which presupposes that we know what our own authentic stance is. So I guess it requires an amount of inner work on the part of everybody so that they can get to a place from which authenticity arises. You can only speak your truth if you have some concept of what your truth might be. It seems to me you've done quite a lot of meditation. Do you feel that your capacity to find your truth arises from that? Or have you found other routes to finding your own authenticity? Um, meditation has been a, a huge, huge help in my life. I, I've sort of gone down a twin track in a sense where I've been really interested in pursuing meditation from quite an early age and various other, you could call spiritual practices and perspectives. Um, and at the same time, I've been really sort of intellectually curious. And at one point I was... Um, uh, studying, doing a master's in post-colonial politics. Wow. And at that point, I uh, was getting good feedback about my ideas and my writing. And I was, you know, thinking about being encouraged to pursue a, a potential career in academia. But I actually had a, a, a bit of a turning point. One day I was walking, I was studying in Aberystwyth University, and I was walking along the uh, the pier there. And my head was so full of um, all of these ideas, complex and abstract ideas about the world. And suddenly it hit me that I was actually looking out at a beautiful view. I was completely dissociated from it, completely disconnected from it. And I actually had a little bit of a panic attack. And I, mm. and I ran back to the flat where I was staying. And it took me a few days to process that. And I actually, in those days, made a very firm decision not to go down the route of academia because I felt, you know, I, I was actually worried it was going to send me insane if I was so disconnected from the, the actual world around me and my head was so full of ideas. And that's when I got much deeper into embodied oh, practices and I sort of realised that for me the simplest way to access an authentic truth is through the body rather than stories and ideas and opinions that come from our mind. Can you say more about that? Yeah, well, it's it's simple in one level, although I understand having shared this with many people over the years, that some people can have certain psychological defences against accessing their body. And particularly some people with trauma can find it difficult to access their body in a in a direct way. So this comes with a kind of preface but for me it's really having the capacity to tune in and notice what's going on in the body on the level of sensation beyond any kind of elaborate description so if I was tuning into my body now 
I'm noticing there's a, you know, there's a slight sense of constriction in my throat, but it doesn't feel, it's just there. I'm not judging it. And if I move down my body, I'm noticing there's a sense of warmth in my chest. So this sort of simple practice orients me to my body. Now, that for me is a a starting point for truth because it's just grounding me in the reality of where I am in this moment right now. Um, And also I then from that, you can build on that. So I believe that the body is a storehouse of incredible wisdom that we ignore at our peril. Obviously having evolved over such a long period of time from the earliest, you know, single celled, creatures to where we are now that's like so many years of you could say evolutionary intelligence and wisdom that's stored in our bodies so from that direct perception of what's going on in your body you can start to tune into it and listen to it there's all sorts of practices that you can use to listen to the wisdom of your body but i really like particularly working with children you can just speak to different parts of your body so if you feel If a child, for example, is feeling really anxious, it could be about parents arguing or it could be about the climate change. You can go into the body. I would always try and go into the body first and just say, can you just notice what's there? Maybe it's a feeling in the stomach. And can you, first of all, just let that feeling in your stomach know that it's okay for it to be there? Brilliant. And then almost always when you do that, um, I would say pretty much 100% of the time, just letting the feeling know it's okay for it to be there gives it space. It removes a lot of the conflict and the tension that we've internalized that feelings should or shouldn't be there. And then you can start to, having located the feeling in the body, you can start to kind of communicate with it. And then you can get more creative. So, you know, if, if that feeling in your stomach had a shape or a name or a character, what would it be? And What's it here to share with you? Uh, What lesson is it bringing? Hmm. That's the kind of approach that I like to take and can reveal a much deeper truth than just a, you know, intellectual, logical, left brain conversation. Yes. Yes. And provided, as you said, some people have complex trauma and accessing their body needs to be done in a safe space. But otherwise, anybody listening could take the time just now, provided you're not driving a car, people, to access our own bodies and feel what's going on. So if I do that, then I can feel a kind of fizzing in my heart space, part of which is excitement at the ideas. No, I don't need to label it, do I? There's a fizzing in my heart space that feels like I feel when I stand on the edge of a cliff. That I could jump off here and who knows what might happen. Or I could take a step back and feel less fizzy. And what really struck me with what you were saying was that if I can talk to that bit and say it's okay to be there, then it expands outwards. Then it feels almost like letting compressed gas out of a out of a container. It just fizzes out sideways and the space becomes more like a an open horizon and less like standing on the edge of a cliff looking down into a very deep dark chasm Mm. fascinating really interesting to explore thank you and then if we just take the time and the just take the time really and the permission in our busy lives to go with that i would be very intrigued to know where that goes so when you do this you've spoken a lot about young people having trauma over the climate because i can imagine going into this space inside myself and feeling it expand and feeling where it takes me But I can also imagine in the end running up against a brick wall of I am not able to change things in the way I want to change them. Does that happen or is that my projection? 
if you were to say to me that that was the brick wall that you're experiencing, I would guide you in the same way Hmm. to see if you can find that sense of something like a brick wall or something like change isn't possible. And where, whereabouts can you notice that, if anywhere? So then if I genuinely go into that space now, it's mm-hmm. um, actually I think it's all around. In fact, if I actually do it, it's not mm-hmm. just around, it's on top. So I end up feeling mm-hmm. as if I'm in a brick box. And it, yeah, it's bricks. Mm-hmm. It's They're red and they're sharp edged and it's got square edges and it feels, I feel really claustrophobic in there. And quite panicky. Could you find somewhere in your body that you might notice that feeling of panic or claustrophobia? Mm -hmm. It's in my heart space. The bit that was feeling on the edge of the cliff is now, I feel there now very tight and very dark and and very fluttery. Could you put a hand there? Would you be okay to do that? Mm -hmm. And could you let that feeling, that panicky, fluttery feeling know that it's okay to be there, maybe just take a deep breath into that space. That's interesting. I don't give myself permission to panic often. So there are a lot of voices going, no, it's not. You have to cope. Right, that's really great. And notice notice the voices. The voices are fine. Let them be there, but bring yourself back to that space. Hmm. And what do you notice happens when you if you just give permission for that feeling, that panicky feeling to be there. That if we were not in the middle of creating a podcast, I would I would be really crying by now. Mm. Okay. Well, whatever you feel is the right next move for you. Well, I think let's stay with this. I think this, we may end up cutting this out, who knows, but actually I think this is a really valuable and interesting place to go, not just for me. Mm. Because giving myself permission to feel the panic Mm. is not something that I'm used to doing. Mm. And when I do that, the bottom of the brick box falls away. Yes. But then I'm in empty space. I'm just, I'm in a, and this is a space that I recognize that is the most frightening thing in my entire existence. Mm. A very, very long time ago, over two decades ago, I did an ayahuasca ceremony. Mm. It's one of those things. I, Anyway, I did it. And we spent a week. And on the third of five ayahuasca sessions, I ended up in this space, which is very cold. And there is nothing except me there. And nothing cares. And... In all the shamanic work I've done, I've met things that terrified me because they were big and frightening and and Mm. big frightening things are scary. But this, the not caring, the nothing being there Mm. is the single most frightening thing I have ever met. Mm. And so now I'm feeling the edges of that. And I'm actually also feeling the edges of the chair and the desk and I can hear you there. So I'm Mm. not completely in it. Mm. Well, I think if we were to keep going with this, I would keep you grounded in your body. So I'd want you to just gently notice the the feeling in your body and where it is and just keep allowing that feeling to be there. Because in a sense, the space for me conjures up an image of kind of existential meaninglessness And underneath that is this sort of terror that we carry. Mm. And underneath that terror, I think, is grief. Yeah. And what's really interesting is that I just took what I would consider to be a completely free breath, which happens very rarely. Mm. Like, you know, in ceremony and otherwise not at all. Sometimes when I'm in craniosacral therapy. So the letting go to step into that. However frightening it is, my body likes it. That's really lovely way to... So I think we've probably subjected the people listening to enough. Mm. Yeah, I would love... That's a really interesting. I will, when I'm on my own, go back and explore that. But thank you. 
for letting us do that. I don't know if it'll survive to the final cut, but but I think in a way, it's an interesting, if everybody just took the time to go that far, they wouldn't have the benefit of you there feeding back. Sorry, listeners, I'm sniffling. It feels like something that's best done when it's held. That doing that on our own might be, might we get lost in the void? Does that happen? Hmm. Um, I think it's definitely better held, but at the same time, I really feel um, and often want to empower people to explore these things on their own as well. Mm. Sometimes it's not easy to find somebody to hold you in that space. So a big sort of driver for me is trying to find out ways to make things accessible and inclusive. Yes. Some of us might have to initially do some of this kind of practice on our own before we can find somebody who can hold us. Mm. I hope that's not true for most, if not all, of the people listening to this, but um, I know it, it can be true for some people. So um, I think, my, you know, I, I really believe more and more that we are more, a lot of what we fear in terms of going inward and looking at things is is cultural conditioning. Mm. And I really you know, if we cut through those layers that tell us about feelings and thoughts and what they mean and what we should be scared of and what we shouldn't be scared of, beneath that, um, you know, Rumi has that quote, um, something like, there is there is a garden beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing. And I will I'll meet see you there. there. Yes. I'll meet you there. Yeah. Yes. So I have that sense if we get beneath the cultural conditioning and just get present with what we're actually experiencing in the moment, trying not to label it or judge it, we um, can not just tolerate it, but actually we can mm. create space in which it can be transformed. Wow, that would be amazing. Yeah, okay. And years ago, many decades ago, I remember co-counselling being a way where people could create space that was inclusive because you offered that and were matched and there was no requirement for a financial exchange. Is that still a thing? Does that still happen? I don't know much about it. I know for parents, there's this great model called listening partnerships. Hmm. My friend Roma, who's um, much more of a parenting expert than I am, she's fantastic, but she's a huge advocate for these listening partnerships, which as I understand it, Two parents, it doesn't actually have to be parents, it could be anyone, but you have a relationship where for 20 minutes a week, the other person will just listen to you and you just right. talk for 20 minutes. Brilliant. And there's no script, there's no technique, it's just the constraint of time right. that ultimately the space and the constraint of time actually allows you to really go deeper and really... Um, process things and get things off your chest. I can imagine. That, that is exactly my experience of co-counseling was when I was a student, but that's exactly what we did. 20 minutes, mm. one person only listens, one person only talks. And how rarely we get that in our world. Mm. The Both the heldness of the time and the freedom to speak to someone who is genuinely listening and part of the genuinely listening is the reciprocity of knowing that then one will be listened to. Don't you think, I might be um, a bit too sort mm -hmm. of focused on this with my background in therapy, but I really feel if more people have that sort of just direct experience of feeling connected and held in an authentic space, and I feel that in this conversation with you, uh, if more people have that, if more parents can give that to children, mm -hmm. uh, I really believe that can have a really radical transformational effect on uh, the environment and the world it, it's certainly you know for me when I'm in these spaces I leave and for a significant amount of time I feel the resonance of that authentic mm. connection it influences how I go about my business and the energy that I'm you know spreading out into the world yes beautiful so we're coming near the end of our time I have I have two probably branching questions but we'll keep them both fairly tight. So in your work with children, again, you've spoken a lot about climate trauma. 
And it seems to me that the children of today, even before Greta Thunberg became a model, but definitely now, are in many ways more aware of the precipice we're heading to than their parents' generation, or particularly their grandparents' generation. In your work with them, with their very sharp awareness, how are you finding they they're then able to situate themselves in an outer world where these conversations still seem not to be happening? I would say the main thing I'm noticing is that young people who have their own experience of climate awakening um, are struggling to find enough adults who are talking honestly and authentically about it. And, you know, been my experience um, seeing some young people in therapy who have really struggled to know how to deal with the extent of what they're seeing happening in the planet. Um, and even for me, you know, I've done so much sort of so-called work on myself and um, think that I'm pretty self-aware, but I still, when a young person sits in front of me and says, like, all the grown-ups are, are lying, the future is hopeless, and I just there's just can't see any point in anything anymore, even then I still feel a strong drive to want to make it better for them. And I think mm. that's natural. Uh, but I, I really have found and been quite tested by that, particularly with the young people experiencing grief or anxiety around climate crisis, trying to make it better does not work. And that just creates another inauthentic connection. So I've had to let go of the part of me that just wants to make it better and actually just be on a level with them and say, I can really see and relate to where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. And just being in that place is, is essential before trying to come up with solutions and making things better. Otherwise, we're missing out such a critical part of this, a critical ingredient in this, which is the uncertainty, the hopelessness, and the grief. Yes. And do you find they all turn to Extinction Rebellion? Because Extinction Rebellion XR is at least asking everyone to tell the truth. That's the first of the XR demands, is, is speak the truth yes. about climate change. Does it work for it's young actually, people? This is actually... Um, oh, a pink boat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, we need a picture of that for yeah. the podcast. So Louis just showed me his pink boat with an XR symbol and tell the truth on it. Yeah. Um, what was the question again? I, the question was, are young people turning towards XR because their request is to tell the truth or do they just think it's hopeless? The, well, there's definitely a lot of young people who are turning to XR and other movements. I probably don't tend to see those young people as much not in my therapy work anyway. I think I tend to see people, young people who have, um, who just feel hopeless and they don't see any point even in doing the Extinction Rebellion thing. I have um, with some uh, clients, you know, suggested too quickly, well, look, there's these amazing movements. I'm so inspired by what Extinction Rebellion are doing. You could get involved and make a difference and, that again, for some young people, is taking them away from this deeper truth that they are carrying that is really important. That is, you know, that question of what is what is the point? How can we find a point and a meaning and motivation to take action? I do think we have to go to that place first. Mm. And of course, a lot of people, there's some great grief work that happens in the Extinction Rebellion movement. And a lot of people have done that work. They've gone to that place and come out the other side, which I think is why it, it's such a often a joyful expression mm. of activism. It's, it's almost the grief work sort of, I think it can take away some of that um, energy of the polarity and, and a lot of the anger that just keeps the cycles going. Yes. That's my hypothesis anyway. Okay. And we are definitely at the end of our time. So I will abandon my next question for next time because I'm sincerely hoping we will come back. And we are planning to come back when your book is published. Do you want to take the last little while, however long you want, to tell us about your book? Yes, I'd love to. So 
I am two chapters away from finishing the first draft of a book. <laughs> Woohoo! Yay! Called um, How the World is Making Our Children Mad and What to Do About It. Wow. And essentially, it's my attempt as a father, child psychotherapist, and someone who cares about children and what's going on in the world to figure out why are we seeing these rises in self-harm, suicide, anxiety, depression, ADHD, just the whole range of mental health problems. We're seeing huge rises in them. And how might that be connected to the bigger problems in the world? And uh, it's, it's separated into two halves. The first half is essentially shadow work for grown-ups who care for children. So it's looking at the roots of these problems. Um, I see the the modern context of you know rises in narcissism learned helplessness all of this kind of stuff but they all have deeper roots and I sort of align myself with sort of Jungian thinking which is a model of psychology we won't have time to go into now but essentially the theory of archetypes archetypes essentially are deep and recurring patterns so narcissism is something that we know through the the early myths people have been talking about and concerned about for a long, long time. It's not a new problem. And my feeling is we need to get to the roots within ourselves as these things can often lie in the shadows of ourselves. And then the second half of the book is more about what the grown-ups can do with children to help them develop the opposite qualities of those roots, which I'm calling the fruits. So if it's learned helplessness and victimhood, the opposite of that is empowerment if it's narcissism and loneliness, the opposite of that is compassion and collaboration. If it's hopelessness or despair, the opposite fruit of that is hope. So, yeah, that's that's the summary. Yay. And it'll be out next year. It's going to be out next April. Brilliant. Published by uh, Vermilion. Fantastic. We will definitely invite you back around the time that comes out because it sounds like the kind of book we all need to read, whether we are parents or not. So we've hit the end of our time. Louis Weinstock, thank you so much for your wisdom and your depth and your integrity and for opening doors to healing. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And that is it for another week. Enormous thanks, as we said, to Louis for his integrity, for his authenticity, for his ability to bring out the authentic in other people, including me. I do spend a lot of my life striving to find authenticity and integrity in the world. But it's rare that I have the opportunity to bring it out in real time when I'm not just sitting on the hill watching the sun go down. So that felt really rather magical. And I'm immensely grateful to Louis for being part of making it happen. And for those of you who want to find ways to facilitate that for yourselves and each other. Within the Accidental Gods membership, we have buddy groups, which have become quite small groups of people who get to know each other extremely well and are able, I believe, to hold these spaces for each other. So that feels like something that you want. Then the membership is at accidentalgods.life and please do not let finances be a bar to you joining. We do have a subscription. We are trying to fund the podcast. But if it's too much, it's not about you not having access. So just get in touch. Let us know. We will make things work. And while you're thinking about that, we will be back next week with another conversation. In the meantime, enormous thanks, as always, to Caro C for the glorious music at the head and foot and for being the world's best sound producer engineer, and general creator of wonderful sound. Thanks to Faith Tillery for the tech and the website, and thanks to you for listening. As ever, if you know of anybody else who would like to step into a world of authenticity, of truth, of being different, of not perpetuating what was and of stepping into what is, then please do share this link. And that's it for now. See you next week. Thank you and goodbye.